Jen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. My Excited. pleasure. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited to have you. I um, I was trying to think. I we must have been in contact for coming up to ten years now. So it's um, it, it's uh, it's been a long time. Uh, you've been in the Salesforce ecosystem. I feel like I'm becoming a bit of a veteran, but um, but you've got one of those interesting backgrounds where I, I'm guessing Salesforce wasn't necessarily by choice. It probably wasn't something you wanted to do growing up. It probably wasn't something you were aspiring to get into when you were studying, whereas nowadays we do see people that, you know, they're, they're destined for the Salesforce world. So what did you actually want to do when you were growing up, when you were studying? What were your aspirations? <laughs> um, I actually didn't have a, have a plan. <laughs> um, it was only until, uh, so I studied computer engineering um, at uni and it was only during those studies, that's when I started to think, okay, what am I going to do with this degree? Uh, I always thought that I'd end up in a large consulting firm um, and, never really heard of Salesforce. I came across it by accident. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I thought that might be the case. I think back then it wasn't, uh, it wasn't something that people were, were aiming for in university, things like that. I think it was um, so many people, so many guests I've had on the podcast just fell into it. But how, how did Salesforce um, land on your plate, I guess? How did you come across an opportunity to be a Salesforce professional? Oh, wow. So the year was 2006. Um, and, uh, at the time, the owner of Square Peg, Nelson Plus, uh, really just saw the potential, um, and took me under his wing and just learned all things Salesforce and the rest is history, I guess you can say. But I, I did have, uh, I do have a love hate relationship with Salesforce. I've been and, uh, working for an implementation partner. Then I've moved into working for the business. Then I moved away from Salesforce and then, and now I'm come back, coming back in. So, um, it's been a ride. Well, we'll explore that love hate relationship, but what like <laughs> 2006 was, um, a very different place for Salesforce, right? So you, you in terms of the evolution yeah. of the platform, in terms of the evolution of the market as well, what yeah, I, definitely. I appreciate it might've turned into a more of a love hate relationship, but what did you love? What were your fondest memories of, um, of being in, consulting in in the the early days of Salesforce in Australia? Salesforce back then was quote unquote simple. Um there it was really what you saw um out of the box is what you got. And so what I really enjoyed was, you know, really rapidly being able to implement these solutions for a the whole range of different businesses from you know, your small not-for-profits you know, all the way up to um, you know, large automotive companies. So, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed just learning how businesses operate and how you know, Salesforce could actually help them in their growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you mentioned um, the, the founder of SquarePeg. I think you, you're, you're referring to Sean Stilwell. Sean um, Stilwell. Who was actually one of my first ever clients when I, I moved into the Salesforce space. So I, I think he must have seen... Old. Yeah, he must have seen something, right? Because to, to set up a consulting firm back then in Salesforce, um, that, that, like way before it was on anyone else's agenda, I think there were so few partners from my understanding yes. back then. And you were the practice manager initially, right? So you you saw the the very early days, like you, you mentioned automotive, I'm guessing you're, you're referring to like Toyota back then. Um, like the, this was the, 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 the real foundations of the, the Australian Salesforce market. Yeah, and... I think others who, like Sean, um, had used it in their own companies and saw how great it was and then started to branch out into um, implementing uh, for others. Um, yeah, I, I think a lot of partners started out that way. Mm -hmm. So you were practice manager and now your, your, your passion is uh, business analysis. When did you really hone in on being a BA and move away from the, the either practice management or the end-to-end the -end kind of consulting um, implementation roles? Yeah, um, I think in hindsight, all the roles I had the opportunity of, of having um, had, you know, business analysis foundations to them. And that's what I really enjoyed was those aspects of, uh, you know, literally analyzing the business and really understanding how um, businesses work and operate and being able to be curious every day, uh, how things work, um, what what do people do to solve their business problems? Um, I loved, I love that. Do you think the roles change though? Because like, if I think about, um, if I think about when I got into the ecosystem around 10 years ago, I think like business analysis 
like you said, was part of roles, right? It wasn't mm. necessarily seen as a standalone role all the time. I think, um, but that's changed, right? Now Salesforce have got the the BA certification. I think we're seeing more mm. and more enterprise level engagements where there are business analysis, uh, business analysts, and also other roles kind of working in tandem. So, what was it seen as back then to you as a business analyst? Was it like was it a career that you could have purely as a BA in the Salesforce space? Yeah, I love this question. Um, I think being a BA, you have almost that freedom to be solution agnostic. And with Salesforce, with their evolution of being, that's what you see is what you get, to now you can build anything um, on the platform. I think there is that um, acknowledgement that you do need to spend uh, that time and invest in that time up front to really understand what the problems are to then set that project up for success. Uh, I think that's that's what's happening now is that there is an emphasis on, on getting, making sure that there is value uh, in what that solution is going to bring before actually diving into uh, that solution itself. So do you, um, do you think like at times there's a need for BAs and functional consultants, let's say, as two different roles um, to work in tandem, or do you feel on some projects it, you know, a functional consultant can be the BA as well? Yes. Yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I feel like it's not a one answer fits all. It really depends on what that project um, is looking to do. I believe that the the BA superpower is really in the beginnings of a project or even prior to a project, uh, understanding the correct problems that we want, we are wanting to solve. Um, it's almost that I've used this analogy before, you know, measure, measure twice, cut once, like just really, you know, taking the time upfront to understand uh, and form what is that path to the outcome. That's, that's going to uh, be, that's going to mean success mm -hmm. for the customer. It's an interesting one, right? Because surely functional consultants should have the same mindset though, right? Like uh, I think of course. to mm. deliver success for a project, there, there should always be um, a, a real focus on the right outcome. Like what is the customer trying to achieve? What's the problem now? Mm. I guess the whole as is to be like, what's the, where, where are we going with this, right? But mm. what, what crossover then do you see in those two roles? Because I think, like some people will say they can do both. Like I can mm -hmm. be a BA or a functional consultant. Some clients will will use those um, job titles interchangeably, right? So um, a company that are hiring for a BA might expect really a functional consultant, but they're titling it a BA and, and vice versa. Like would, what would you say that the differences are between a functional consultant and a business analyst in your experience? Yeah. Okay. So my experience is that the functional consultant does have that domain knowledge. So they can on the spot quickly just determine um, a path of, oh, this, this is possible or this may not be so possible. We're hitting some limitations here and being able to quickly identify that um, uh, when that need arises. And I think for if, if you were just, let's say, quote unquote, purely a BA, you're not focused on just Salesforce. Uh, you have a bit of a mindset of, okay, look at the solution as a whole. What are the um, other platforms or technologies at play here that we can actually also um, look at? So there's a there's a there's a a bit of a need to understand what that landscape is up front. You not know, understand, okay, yeah, actually, just a functional consultant is is more than enough for this type of project. Or no, we need a BA that can overlook and oversee the, um, I guess, the entire landscape. So I guess maybe a functional consultant comes in when Salesforce is the chosen solution, right? And then you're looking to use Salesforce in the best way possible to solve a business problem that mm. may have been identified by a BA, but a BA can be useful even before Salesforce is the chosen technology to understand the key requirements and what, what is being driven and, and where we're going with the scope of whatever they're trying to achieve. Yeah, that's right. Like a BA is really good at, I guess, making clear of priorities or making clear on um, what is it that will actually bring the most value in the end. So more of that stra strategy type of work. So how do you feel about the BA certification in Salesforce? 
how do I feel about it? Oh, that's a tough question because I myself haven't taken the BA certification. Um, and I think just certification in general, I think what it does, it gives you the tools, the techniques on being able to carry out um, those tasks. But you don't necessarily need the certification to be a really good BA, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. But how important to you is Salesforce knowledge as a BA? Because you mentioned system agnostic, like, you you know, a BA is transferable. Like you, a good BA, I guess, could come out of a Salesforce project and go into a PEGA project and still be Mm. effective. But but do you feel now where Salesforce is obviously a lot broader, it's not the simple platform that you, you mentioned you worked with back in 2006. So if a functional consultant is able to steer and guide the best solution with Salesforce and a BA doesn't necessarily need to, to be that functional consultant, but do they still need to understand what's possible, what's you know um, recommendable um, for, for the Salesforce solution? I, I don't think this is just for Salesforce. I think as a BA you are inherently curious. So you want to know what is is possible. So I would say that you don't need to have that knowledge going in to that project, but it's very advantageous to have knowledge about it. So I would say don't stop yourself from going into a Salesforce career if you know nothing about it because you can always pick that up. You can always learn whilst you're on those projects. Uh, but yeah, definitely having knowledge about the technologies is going to be helpful in your elicitation of requirements or, or problem definitions. What about configuration then? Do you feel like that's something that a BA should know how to do, even if it's like conceptually rather than actually executing the, the build? Great question there. Um, I think it actually comes down to personal preference. Like, uh, do you do you like to um, explore, you know, new ways of working or do you like to learn about new products in general? Um, and Salesforce isn't hard to pick up um the, the concepts there isn't aren't new so uh yeah if you like tinkering i would say go for it yeah like again that comes down to client preference as well right because i see some ba roles that need someone to do flows and then mm. other ba roles is like strictly you don't touch salesforce you you know, don't have admin um admin rights at all um so yeah that, that's what i find interesting in that it is a skill or a, a job title that can mean different things to different companies. And I think, yes, and, and that can sometimes be frustrating for job seekers because they're like, you know, they might be a BA that doesn't tinker with the platform at all, never has, never has mm. been in an environment where they're expected to, but then they're going to interviews and that's an expectation from another client, another company that, you know, would expect someone to be able to answer questions on how to build a flow. Mm, yeah. And I think it also comes uh, back to how do organizations define what a business analyst is and what does business analyst analysis mean to them? Mm-hmm. And I, I feel that every role should have some of the foundations of what a, of what a business analyst can do or what business analysis is. It's such a transferable skill set to any role. And you, you've managed teams of BAs before. So I believe in, in roles, you've been like BA practice lead, practice manager. So, um, and that's not just Salesforce, right? That's BAs across the suite of technology that, that the business is using. So what, having managed people before and being around other BAs, what do you think is the most important skill set of a BA? Definitely people skills. Uh, being able to engage, talk to people, understand, be empathetic, be curious, like all those things. Um, when you're solving problems you need to understand the people side that's what i think have you seen people develop those like are they can you can you see a junior ba and you just know like they've already got those skills it's just now adding depth and you know evolving their knowledge of of different people and you know as they get more experienced and more senior they're going to be a really good ba or have mm. you seen people that might not have those skills when you first see them but then they're things that can be picked up and learned like people skills uh, do you feel you kind of have them or you don't I think you can definitely learn them because people are not aware um, that that is what is going to get them further um, into a career that they prefer or into more exciting projects. Um, and it's it's almost the being aware that that is what's going to help them. Then they start to think, okay, I can incorporate 
uh, some of these people skills into my meetings or into my workshops um, or even day-to-day uh, dealings um, with stakeholders. Uh, yeah, I definitely feel that it's something that you can learn. And even for me now, I feel like I'm I'm forever learning new skills and even unlearning things that I thought um, I was, you know, stuck on that it was just the one way to do something. That's and that's not true. There's so many ways to to get to uh, the same outcome. How have you done that though? Because is it just absurd? Because I guess you're you're a senior you're a senior BA. You're probably often leading workshops rather than observing, right? So um, I would imagine there's other people that are coming through, watching you and observing and learning from you. But when you get to a certain level, how are you still able to see that there are new ways of doing things? Like how do you how do you take that on board and, and go, okay, like I've been doing this for 15 years or however long? Yeah, feedback. Yeah. <laughs> feedback is one of the things. Um, I love to ask my stakeholders, oh, did you find that useful? What would what would you like me to do next time that could help you? Because everyone's going to be different and every meeting is never the same as the last. Um, I always use this as an opportunity that if you're going to be 1% better, you're still better than the day before. Mm -hmm. So like what advice would you have for someone that is coming through and, and about to run workshops and cause that must be pretty daunting. Like if you've not done that necessarily before, do you, is it something you can practice? Like, can you not, not practice live, but are there like, I remember um, when I've been employed in the past by other recruitment companies, we used to do like um, role plays in front of everyone Mm. in the office and that's daunting. (laughs) Everyone hated it. Right. It was like, so scary because you've got all of your peers around you and you're like role playing, but you, you actually learned so much through that. But is that something like VA should be considering, like actually doing like um, proper practice, like, you know, not just not just learning on the job, but being like in a, in a kind of classroom environment with their peers to, to actually maximize their, their ability to deliver a workshop? Yeah, no, that, I mean, that's an amazing idea if people had the time and it's always that factor of, <laughs> yeah. I don't have enough time. I actually just need to run this workshop. Um, so, you know, regardless of how much, um, experience that you might already have, don't underestimate preparation. Preparation is almost, I feel, 80% of the work leading up to facilitating um, a meeting or a workshop. Uh, doing the upfront work, knowing what it is that you're trying to achieve, uh, who are your stakeholders, what you know and what you don't know, uh, being very clear when you're going in. And then also just having that open mind that things may go pear-shaped, but that's okay. Um, You can always recover from that. Uh, And and yes, it does take uh, practice, uh, but don't let that stop you from taking those first steps. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. And um, can you remember the last time that you um, went into like a, a new, completely new client stakeholder that you'd never worked with before and needing to build rapport? Like what, what, what's your go-to to to like get off on a good grounding with a, a client? Mm, yeah, um, be, be curious who they are, what they do, what their team does. Um, just as like you're meeting a new colleague for the first time, uh, get to know who they are and just be genuinely curious about what they do and what this project will mean for them if it was to be successful. And I think just listening and empathising uh, with stakeholders, um, you can build rapport quite easily that way. And obviously we hear all the time like difficult stakeholders. It's something that like that, that term is used regularly. What what does that usually mean to you? Like why is a stakeholder typically difficult? Oh, that's a loaded question. Um, I think it comes down to what are they trying to achieve or what are they trying to tell you? Um, Really listen and not offer up solutions just yet i want to think about that actually well it's a, it's an interesting one because you because you, i guess stakeholders like even not just related to salesforce right I, I, if i think about um like my mum um was uh was a executive assistant and she got she was managing one of her clients was historically really difficult to deal with 
Um, mm. And she went into that being like, this this person I'm going to be working for is really difficult. People haven't enjoyed working for them before. But then mm. her view of the person was amazing. Like they they really, they re- like they got on really well. She really enjoyed working with them. And I think it's going back to your point, it's like around curiosity, like not giving solutions, right? Like just, just listening to the person, understanding what they're trying to achieve. Like what are they looking to get out of this relationship? Like what does good look like to them? All of those things where if you actually if you approach it the right way, I, I guess a stakeholder that might have been difficult for someone else isn't always going to be difficult for you. And and going into that, expecting someone to be difficult because that's what you've heard or that's that's the kind of um, aura they have um, might not always be the best way to approach it. Like if you go yeah. into every engagement with a new stakeholder with a like completely clear mind of this person just could be a great person to work with. I mean, I've never been a BA, so that might be more, more difficult than it sounds, <laughs> but... Uh, giving everyone a chance to to be a good stakeholder. Yeah, just be empathetic as well. Um, and you know, is it the the topic areas that are you know making the conversations difficult? I don't feel like the stakeholders are difficult. It's it's that what you're discussing may not come so easily to discuss, and it could be a whole range of reasons. And you know, um, a way to get to the bottom of it is maybe you need a one-on-one with that stakeholder and really understand what is it behind um, what they're trying to say. Um, Again, it kind of goes back to that, you know, human to human connection, engagement, understanding. Mm -hmm. You you mentioned preparation is really important for meetings and and like running a workshop and stuff. How important do you find um, setting an agenda to be? (laughs) Agenda is so useful. Um, It helps People don't like surprises. So if you even have just a rough idea of what uh, that what you're going to go through in that meeting, it, it helps everyone. Um, and it also helps you uh, keep yourself on track or, or the meeting on track. And if there are other topics or other things that other people want to discuss, you can always change the agenda if you've got the flexibility to. So mm-hmm. I feel that agenda is just a way to be a guide for the day so that everyone knows what's coming up or what to expect. I think that's something that a lot of more junior people might struggle with initially because it's like you it's quite not not a dominant thing but it's like you know I'm setting the agenda this is what mm. I want to discuss and and going especially if you're like say you're a junior BA you're going in you've got like a CIO uh, head of sales like you've got these people that perceive to be senior and um, decision makers and all these things and then you're setting the agenda how would you approach that is it like before the meeting you say right this is what my understanding of what we're all looking to achieve from this is who wants to add anything to the agenda like how, how can you do that in a soft way to be confident that you're not just putting a list of things that might not be important to the other people yeah sure um and you know that could just be one meeting of many as well so when when we're talking about planning and preparation it's not just also isolated to that a single meeting you kind of need to look at it as a whole like are you having multiple conversations with different stakeholders that whole week and um, and you know should they all have their same same agenda to uh, ensure that you're getting you know an unbiased view of what it is that you're seeing out to achieve so all of these are are factors but definitely um getting a an opinion beforehand um is also handy but you don't at the same time want to have analysis paralysis so yeah. don't, don't don't get too hung up on it um again it's just a guide and if you feel that oh you know we're getting away from the objective that's when the agenda is really good to say oh, actually the outcome what we're trying to achieve is x today mm-hmm. we can take that um you know topic into a different discussion at a different time but if you feel that actually that topic that you're raising directly impacts what we're trying to achieve then you you let that um be discussed Mm -hmm. yeah Um, yeah and it it is it is a little bit of um trusting your gut at times um but again going back to what is the purpose of that meeting you don't want to waste people's time Mm -hmm. either You're, you're, you're gathered together specifically to get a particular outcome yeah and uh, any golden nuggets of information around running a good workshop, like things that have worked particularly well for you over the years? Yes, listen. <laughs> <laughs> Just really listen um, to what people are saying. And now with lots of meetings being virtual or remote, uh, always try and put your camera on. Uh, you know, seeing cues 
facial expressions, if someone looks like they're confused or they're thinking, you might want to give a pause and maybe ask them a question. Was there something that, you know, that you thought of that you wanted to share? Like those are um, little things that you can actually find really golden information that you might not have otherwise if um, you weren't actively looking for those cues. Yeah, like it's an interesting one because obviously we've we've seen like the, the world has gone very remote and um, we're now starting to see obviously some more companies looking for people back in the office more. But BA and business analysis and workshops, that like when anyone ever talks about like where there potentially is a need to be face-to-face, that is kind of the, the area that people discuss like that that requirements mm. gathering, you know, the, the stakeholder engagement, like the, the, the face-to-face, like the in-person um, communication two ways where it's really important that everyone's on the same page seems to be where everyone kind of hones in on, if I need to do this, then I'll go into the office. Or, you know, that part of my role is probably the one area that, that, um, that has a greater emphasis on human connection. Have mm. you found it to be harder now to do that to do that, those tasks than, than before when, when everything kind of was in person? I'm finding the opposite, really? actually. I'm finding it's far easier to communicate um, through video. It's, it's almost instead of talking to one person, you're talking to many at the same time. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's my experience. And um, I, I have to say that I haven't been... I haven't needed to hold an in-person workshop for a while now. Um, all of my engagements have been online. Yeah, I think it would be really difficult now to to have an exclusively online event, as in because I think, like, say you ha- say you needed ten people in a room, there's going to be at least three, four, five that can't make it on that day, mm. right? So then, yeah. if you've got five people in a room and five people on video, it's probably going to be a bit more difficult. So actually, it's better to have all or nothing in my opinion like all on video or all if if you can all get in a room and you all want to be in a room great but like having half and half probably doesn't work so well um yeah so so yeah i i can completely see why having a video uh, like a call would be beneficial in some ways and and some ways i my perception would be it would be challenging but I guess if you're saying like things like having your video on, like if everyone is engaged, you can see everyone's faces. Like it's so much easier than if people that you, you you're running a workshop and three people have got the video off. Like how can you possibly know mm. how they're like absorbing that information? Yeah, yeah, and I'm actually finding that if you yourself are engaging through camera, that other people just naturally want to engage with you, mm-hmm. and they turn their camera on as well. I haven't actually come across any stakeholders who who don't turn their camera on. Yeah. And would you ask them to if they had it off? Uh, I haven't actually needed to, but if, if a situation arose, I, I would say, oh, you know, if you're comfortable, please turn it on. But, yeah. you know, it's not a must-have. Yeah. It's really up to, you know, how comfortable they are um, being on camera as well. You want them to be comfortable um, in, in meetings. Of course. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's not a one-size-fits-all for everyone. So um, mm. final question. So obviously we've, we've found two questions. So we've spoken about like the need for a BA up front and uh, to mm-hmm. really understand the business goals and objectives and, and where the, the project's going. At what point does a business analyst become less needed on a project? Oh, I would say that uh, what they do changes. I wouldn't say that they're needed less. So it's almost like at the beginning of the project, uh, they're there to lead and guide and facilitate, whereas perhaps their role turns into more of a supporting role. Like what if new information arises and you need to pivot or um, there's there's questions that may not necessarily mean that there's a change in the solution, but it might mean a change in the process or there's um, something that needs to be augmented uh, to, to the solution. So I feel that um, a BA is never not needed, uh, but their role just might change throughout the project depending on where that focus is. And for you, um, we see a lot of like, admins that are looking to progress to functional consultant, platform manager, some to developer. Um, not always a BA role, though. Like, I mean, it's it's often a skill that people are developing because they know they need to for as part of their role, but it's not always mm. a role that goes, you know, I'm going to be an admin, then I'm going to be a BA, and because sometimes they, they feel they're losing those 
the hands-on element of their role. Why do you think mm. it would be a good role for, for or, or who do you think it would be a good role for if they're kind of looking to make that transition? Or um, to, to being a BA, you mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think if you are naturally curious <laughs> and you love learning about how businesses work and operate, uh, you know, BA is the, the perfect role for you to 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 learn all that and and to be curious uh, actively every day. Do you think it's really for someone that has an interest greater than just Salesforce though? Because obviously a lot of people love Salesforce, right? That's all they want to do. Yeah. They don't want to. Do you think really as a to be an effective BA, you can't be like, I guess, uh, blinkered by, by Salesforce? Mm, yeah, no, great question. Uh, like, like I say, I think it really depends on the customer that you're implementing for. If they've got um, other technologies in their stack, uh, then there's an opportunity there to also, you know, question like how does Salesforce fit in in your ecosystem or in that landscape, um, and then you have more opportunity to to go just beyond um, Salesforce there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you mentioned uh, another question just came to mind. It's a curveball one, but you mentioned towards mm. the beginning that uh, love hate relationship with Salesforce. So, what would you change? Like, if there was anything you could change about the Salesforce ecosystem, what would that be? Oh, I don't think I hate Salesforce for the um, capability. It's more of a, for me, I always feel that I am forever wanting to learn new things. So it's almost, you know, every five years, I, I feel, feel a bit of an itch to, to learn something new. And at times it's because, oh, I'm seeing the same problems over and over again because Salesforce is really good at solving those types of problems and that's why they always see that. And that's kind of where what I mean by love-hate. It's like I love the platform. I love what it can do. Uh, but at the same time, I want to see more. You get that itch. That that itch of I want to know what how people do business in this industry or yeah. Or in that department, yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Awesome. Well, thank you so much and uh, really enjoyed catching up and and hearing more about your journey and and also the the role of a BA. If uh, anyone wants to reach out, pick your brains, ask any questions, where where is the best place to find you? Find me on LinkedIn. Um, My uh, inbox is open there. And um, yeah, happy to be answering any questions. If you're on the fence, you're not sure um, if BA is the right, path for you yeah hit me up and you know happy to chat about you know what your ambitions or aspirations are awesome thank you so much thanks for having me i really enjoyed today my pleasure